This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 23 The whole population of the valley seemed to be gathered within the precincts of the grove. In the distance could be seen the long front of the T its immense piazza swarming with men, arrayed in every variety of fantastic costume, and all vociferating with animated gestures, while the whole interval between it and the place where I stood was enlivened by groups of females, fancifully decorated, dancing, capering, and uttering wild exclamations. As soon as they descried me, they set up a shout of welcome, and a band of them came dancing towards me, chanting as they approached some wild recitative. The change in my garb seemed to transport them with delight, and clustering about me on all sides, they accompanied me towards the tea. When, however, we drew near it, these joyous nymphs paused in their career, and parting on either side permitted me to pass on to the now densely thronged building. So soon as I mounted to the pee, pee I saw at a glance that the revels were fairly under way. What lavish plenty reigned around! Warwick feasting his retainers with beef and ale was a niggard to the noble Mahavy. All along the piazza of the tea were arranged elaborately carved canoe-shaped vessels, some twenty feet in length, filled with newly made poe poe, and sheltered from the sun by the broad leaves of the banana. At intervals were heaps of green breadfruit, raised in pyramidical stacks, resembling the regular piles of heavy shot to be seen in the yard of an arsenal. Inserted into the interstices of the huge stones which formed the pee, pee were large boughs of trees, hanging from the branches of which, and screened from the sun by their foliage, were innumerable little packages with leafy coverings, containing the meat of the numerous hogs which had been slain, done up in this manner to make it more accessible to the crowd. Leaning against the railing of the piazza were an immense number of long, heavy bamboos, plugged at the lower end, and with their projecting muzzles stuffed with a wad of leaves. These were filled with water from the stream, and each of them might hold from four to five gallons. The banquet being thus spread, naught remained but for every one to help himself at his pleasure. Accordingly, not a moment passed, but the transplanted boughs I have mentioned were rifled by the throng of the fruit they certainly had never borne before. Calabashes of poe poe were continually being replenished from the extensive receptacle in which that article was stored, and multitudes of little fires were kindled about the tea for the purpose of roasting the breadfruit. Within the building itself was presented a most extraordinary scene. The immense lounge of mats lying between the parallel rows of the trunks of coconut trees and extending the entire length of the house, at least two hundred feet, was covered by the reclining forms of a host of chiefs and warriors, who were eating at a great rate, or soothing the cares of Polynesian life in the sedative fumes of tobacco. The smoke was inhaled from large pipes, the bowls of which, made out of small coconut shells, were curiously carved in strange heathenish devices. These were passed from mouth to mouth by the recumbent smokers, each of whom, taking two or three prodigious whiffs, handed the pipe to his neighbor, sometimes for that purpose stretching indolently across the body of some dozing individual whose exertions at the dinner-table had already induced sleep. The tobacco used among the Taipees was of a very mild and pleasing flavor, and as I always saw it in leaves, and the natives appeared pretty well supplied with it, I was led to believe that it must have been the growth of the valley. Indeed, Cory Cory gave me to understand that this was the case, but I never saw a single plant growing on the island. At Nukahiva, and I believe in all the other valleys, the weed is very scarce, being only obtained in small quantities from foreigners, and smoking is consequently with the inhabitants of these places a very great luxury. How it was that the Taipees were so well furnished with it I cannot divine. I should think them too indolent to devote any attention to its culture, and indeed, as far as my observation extended, not a single atom of the soil was under any other cultivation than that of shower and sunshine. 
The tobacco plant, however, like the sugar cane, may grow wild in some remote part of the vale. There were many in the tea for whom the tobacco did not furnish a sufficient stimulus, and who accordingly had recourse to arva, as a more powerful agent in producing the desired effect. Arva is a root very generally dispersed over the South Seas, and from it is extracted a juice, the effects of which upon the system are at first stimulating in a moderate degree, but it soon relaxes the muscles, and exerting a narcotic influence produces a luxurious sleep. In the valley this beverage was universally prepared in the following way. Some half-dozen young boys seated themselves in a circle around an empty wooden vessel, each one of them being supplied with a certain quantity of the roots of the arva, broken into small bits and laid by his side. A coconut goblet of water was passed around the juvenile company, who, rinsing their mouths with its contents, proceeded to the business before them. This merely consisted in thoroughly masticating the arva and throwing it mouthful after mouthful into the receptacle provided. When a sufficient quantity had been thus obtained, water was poured upon the mass, and being stirred about with the forefinger of the right hand, the preparation was soon in readiness for use. The arva has medicinal qualities. Upon the Sandwich Islands, it has been employed with no small success in the treatment of scrofulous affections, and in combating the ravages of a disease for whose frightful inroads the ill-starred inhabitants of that group are indebted to their foreign benefactors. But the tenants of the Taipei Valley, as yet exempt from these inflictions, generally employ the arva as a minister to social enjoyment, and a calabash of the liquid circulates among them as the bottle with us. Mahavi, who was greatly delighted with the change in my costume, gave me a cordial welcome. He had reserved for me a most delectable mess of koku, well knowing my partiality for that dish and had likewise selected three or four young coconuts, several roasted breadfruit, and a magnificent bunch of bananas, for my especial comfort and gratification. These various matters were at once placed before me, but Kori Kori deemed the banquet entirely insufficient for my wants until he had supplied me with one of the leafy packages of pork, which, notwithstanding the somewhat hasty manner in which it had been prepared, possessed a most excellent flavor and was surprisingly sweet and tender. Pork is not a staple article of food among the people of the Marquesas. Consequently, they pay little attention to the breeding of the swine. The hogs are permitted to roam at large in the groves, where they obtain no small part of their nourishment from the coconuts which continually fall from the trees. But it is only after infinite labor and difficulty that the hungry animal can pierce the husk and shell so as to get at the meat, I have frequently been amused at seeing one of them, after crunching the obstinate nut with his teeth for a long time unsuccessfully, get into a violent passion with it. He would then root furiously under the coconut, and with a fling of his snout, toss it before him on the ground. Following it up, he would crunch at it again savagely for a moment, and the next knock it on one side, pausing immediately after, as if wondering how it could so suddenly have disappeared. In this way, the persecuted coconuts were often chased half across the valley. The second day of the Feast of Calabashes was ushered in by still more uproarious noises than the first. The skins of innumerable sheep seemed to be resounding to the blows of an army of drummers. Startled from my slumbers by the din, I leaped up and found the whole household engaged in making preparations for immediate departure. Curious to discover of what strange events these novel sounds might be the precursors, and not a little desirous to catch a sight of the instruments which produced the terrific noise, I accompanied the natives as soon as they were in readiness to depart for the taboo groves. The comparatively open space that extended from the tea toward the rock, to which I have before alluded as forming the ascent to the place, was, with the building itself, now altogether deserted by the men the whole distance being filled by bands of females, shouting and dancing under the influence of some strange excitement. I was amused at the appearance of four or five old women, who, in a state of utter nudity, with their arms extended flatly down their sides and holding themselves perfectly erect, were leaping stiffly into the air, 
like so many sticks bobbing to the surface after being pressed perpendicularly into the water. They preserved the utmost gravity of countenance and continued their extraordinary movements without a single moment's cessation. They did not appear to attract the observation of the crowd around them, but I must candidly confess that for my own part I stared at them most pertinaciously. Desirous of being enlightened with regard to the meaning of this peculiar diversion, I turned inquiringly to Kori Kori. That learned Taipee immediately proceeded to explain the whole matter thoroughly. But all that I could comprehend from what he said was that the leaping figures before me were bereaved widows, whose partners had been slain in battle many moons previously, and who at every festival gave public evidence in this manner of their calamities. It was evident that Kori Kori considered this an all-sufficient reason for so indecorous a custom, but I must say that it did not satisfy me as to its propriety. Leaving these afflicted females, we passed on to the Hula Hula ground. Within the spacious quadrangle, the whole population of the valley seemed to be assembled, and the sight presented was truly remarkable. Beneath the sheds of bamboo which opened towards the interior of the square, reclined the principal chiefs and warriors, while a miscellaneous throng lay at their ease under the enormous trees, which spread a majestic canopy overhead. Upon the terraces of the gigantic altars, at either end, were deposited green breadfruit in baskets of coconut leaves, large rolls of tapa, bunches of ripe bananas, clusters of mami apples, the golden-hued fruit of the artu tree, and baked hogs, laid out in large wooden trenches, fancifully decorated with freshly plucked leaves, whilst a variety of rude implements of war were piled in confused heaps before the ranks of hideous idols. Fruits of various kinds were likewise suspended in leaf and baskets, from the tops of poles planted uprightly, and at regular intervals along the lower terraces of both altars. At their base were arranged two parallel rows of cumbersome drums, standing at least fifteen feet in height, and formed from the hollow trunks of large trees. Their heads were covered with shark skins, and their barrels were elaborately carved with various quaint figures and devices. At regular intervals they were bound round by a species of cinnate of various colors, and strips of native cloth flattened upon them here and there. Behind these instruments were built slight platforms upon which stood a number of young men, who, beating violently with the palms of their hands upon the drumheads, produced those outrageous sounds which had awakened me in the morning. Every few minutes these musical performers hopped down from their elevation into the crowd below, and their places were immediately supplied by fresh recruits. Thus an incessant din was kept up that might have startled pandemonium. Precisely in the middle of the quadrangle were placed perpendicularly in the ground, a hundred or more slender, fresh-cut poles, stripped of their bark, and decorated at the end with a floating pennon of white tapa, the whole being fenced about with a little picket of canes. For what purpose these singular ornaments were intended, I in vain endeavored to discover. Another most striking feature of the performance was exhibited by a score of old men, who sat cross-legged in the little pulpits which encircled the trunks of the immense trees growing in the middle of the enclosure. These venerable gentlemen, who I presume were the priests, kept up an uninterrupted monotonous chant, which was nearly drowned in the roar of drums. In the right hand they held a finely woven grass fan, with a heavy black wooden handle, curiously chased. These fans they kept in continual motion. But no attention whatever seemed to be paid to the drummers or to the old priests, the individuals who composed the vast crowd present being entirely taken up in chatting and laughing with one another, smoking, drinking arva, and eating. For all the observation it attracted, or the good it achieved, the whole savage orchestra might with great advantage to its own members and the company in general have ceased the prodigious uproar they were making. In vain I questioned Kori Kori and others of the natives as to the meaning of the strange things that were going on. All their explanations were conveyed in such a mass of outlandish gibberish and gesticulation 
that I gave up the attempt in despair. All that day the drums resounded, the priests chanted, and the multitude feasted and roared till sunset, when the throng dispersed, and the taboo groves were again abandoned to quiet and repose. The next day the same scene was repeated until night, when this singular festival terminated.